provided you all with the lecture notes or the lecture PowerPoints from uh, this part, from part eight, part nine, part 10, part 11. So you have all those. Uh, hopefully you're able to print them off um, or whatever, but uh, now you have all that stuff as well. What do we know about categorization? Uh, can anybody tell me what they know about categorization and how critical categorization is? I mean, we'll, we'll eventually come up to some definitions of what categorization is. Can somebody guess? Uh, to me, before I knew anything about patterns of technology, and I'm still working on that, but I think uh, this is the concept that I write most that our brains um, almost organically are kind of able to start to group things together. It's how I'm able to identify small, okay. critical things within really giving them as writing utensils for okay. All right. So, innately, uh, who believes that? Who believes that we are? Hardwired, and this kind of gets into the next two chapters, the language chapters. But uh, who thinks we're hardwired as a species to categorize stuff? And why do you believe that? Anybody who has their hand up? Well, I just think that. Wait, don't you sit back there usually? I like to change it up. <laughs> to me. Okay, never mind. Um, I think it lessens our cognitive. Okay, so people with OCD then probably have troubles with categorization, I would imagine. Uh, but is that part of the diagnosis of OCD? They can't categorize properly? Okay, so, but would you think in general people with OCD would probably have some So it might not be part of the diagnosis, but it might be something related to, in that case, people with OCD. Anybody else? What do you think categorization is? Or why it's so helpful? Well, evolutionarily, it probably is enables someone to categorize what's harmful or dangerous from what's safe or not, so that you can you know, reproduce and pass on genes. Okay, so animals show categorization. Um, they're able to, and this is across a, a wide variety of species, that's a whole other class, animal cognition, we won't get into it too much here, but uh, all sorts of animals categorize from an early age, some innately, so they're kind of born with it. Anything else relates to categorization? I mean, the fact that we see it in adults, children, and animals, even computers can categorize pretty quickly. What does that tell us? I mean, it might be hereditary, so it has some obvious advantage, but when can categorization not be good? I mean, it's good that we know when we hear this noise off in the distance, it's not saber-toothed tiger about to jump out at us and eat us, but when would categorization be a problem? Anybody think of a problem maybe you have encountered that's related to your inability to properly categorize? I so want to Saying now? 
you view somebody as your out group during um, during a crime, you're less likely um, to accurately recall that individual because you've okay. already placed it in your out group. Okay. So one problem with categorization, and we all might be guilty of it, is that we often uh, uh, tap into certain biases when we're categorizing. You witness a crime, so somebody asks you questions about the crime, uh, you didn't really see the crime, you were there but you didn't see certain parts of it, you start filling in details, and we all know how bad eyewitness testimony is. So that could be a problem with categorization. What else is kind of a problem with categorization? Or that would impede your progress forward on solving some kind of problem because of categorization. do when you categorize something? Like if I hold this up, what processes are you engaging in to categorize this? I mean, you all probably know what this is. No TOTs allowed. But how do you know what this is versus how do you know what it isn't? Because, because, because Because when we make a categorization decision, what in essence are we doing? It seems like you're looking at the features that make up that okay. specific category. So it seems like one of the problems might be that you get honed in on one feature and you're okay. not able to adapt to the other features. Okay. Can you think of a real world example where you might hone in on one feature at the expense of others and you have trouble? Continuing that categorization. How many of you are familiar with the DSM? No, most everybody's hands should be right now. So the DSM. Let me give you an example from the DSM, and you, you try to tell me what the disorder is. Now this is going to be really difficult. Uh, I, I'm sure that it's going to be really difficult, and I doubt anybody in here will get the disorder. Here we go. Chronological age is at least five years or equivalent developmental level. What's a disorder? on page 109, I mean, you've all memorized what uh -huh. disorders are, uh, the pages. Um, let's see. Oh, here's this, this might, here's another feature. The behavior is clinically significant as manifested by either a frequency of twice a week or <laughs> less three, or at least three consecutive months or the presence of clinically significant distress or impairment in social, academic, occupational, or other important areas of functioning. Close. Graduate school. <laughs> <laughs> ding, ding, ding. <laughs> Did you Google that? Yeah. <laughs> oh, no, I don't Google. Jeez. Put, just cut Google away. She said uh, intermittent explosive disorder. <clears throat> not, not the one I'm looking for, but it's, it's getting closer. Now, what you should be noticing is you're narrowing down of the possibilities. I've given you two of three features. If I give you the third one, you'll know it lickety split, but I'm not going to do that just yet. No. Anybody know the disorder? I mean, I mean, the DSM is nothing more. Reactive 
second one was the behavior is clinically significant as manifested by either a frequency of twice a week. Enderesis. Or endoprisis. There you go. Oh. Now, if I had said. <laughs> you would have picked that one. No, wait, that's the true thing. This is the real thing here, folks. I'm not making this up. I couldn't make this up. If I gave you the first feature listed, repeated voiding of urine into bed or clothes, whether voluntarily or intentional. So I gave you features, but they weren't the best features. In fact, the fourth feature of this disorder is fourth feature is the behavior is not due ex exclusively to the direct physiological effect of a substance, i.e. diuretic or a general medical condition, e.g. diabetes, spina bifida, or a seizure disorder. So categorization, in some extent, depends on what you focus in when you're categorizing. Now, I explicitly made it more difficult than it was. I gave you a rather broad set of features. And I imagine in your brains you were narrowing it down, narrowing it down, narrowing it down, which we do in categorization. And then I gave you uh, a more defining feature of enuresis and boom, you got it and you were correct. All right, take a break, 50 minutes, just like you said. All right, so we were talking about uh, and we did a little exercise to look at uh, this idea of categorization, um, how it can be beneficial. So knowing what uh, this thing is and being able to classify it relatively quickly, but also if I give you not incorrect information, but a very broad information that's going to affect how well you're able to categorize uh, something, in this case, a uh, diagnosis from the uh, DSM. So what do we know about categorizations uh, and categorization? It's also related to concept formation. Uh, and we talked about concept formation in the semantic memory chapter. So when you think of a concept, dog, for example, uh, you call to bear all sorts of things related to dog, things that are typical, has four legs, usually barks, usually has a tail, usually, and things that might be atypical, uh, your dog, uh, your dog is different than somebody else's dog, um, if you've been bitten by a dog, uh, if you've been chased by a dog, wh whatever. So we have all these different concepts that then relate to how well or how not so well we categorize. But as one of you mentioned as well, categorization should result in kind of a savings for us, uh, uh, an economy of uh, representation. And when we talked about semantic memory and also concept uh, identification and concept uh, being able to come up with a concept for an item, it's very critical that we try to be as economical as possible. Now you might say, why do we need to be so economical if semantic and long-term memory is infin uh, infinite? Anybody answer that question? Because that doesn't seem to make sense, at least to me. If our long-term and semantic memories are infinite, and we can put lots of stuff in there, and we've put lots of stuff in there, why do we still need to be uh, economical when storing concept and categorization information? Because time isn't infinite. Okay. And if it was just kind of not organized in any way, it would take forever to get the information. Okay. So think of that as kind of a, a something you might not expect. Long-term memory, infinite, but yet we still, or we should still, uh, store things there in an economical, non-redundant type of way. What does uh, this redundancy issue do for us in kind of a positive way? 
Why is it good, in other words, to not be redundant with information in long-term memory? So not only a time issue, like Kate said, but also a processing issue, like Catherine said. Think of any other reasons why it's better to be economical or cheap. I guess you could call it cheap, too. Why so? Would it be easier to retrieve the memory as well as then to have it kind of categorized? Should be. Again, we showed that. Not so terribly well with the uh, DSM thing. But again, it depends on what information you're given. If it's a broad spectrum of knowledge, it's going to be usually more difficult to weed through that. Now, had I given this definition to somebody who had 30 years in the field, had won major awards, would they still have made that? mistake or taken that long to come up with that. Maybe, maybe not. That gets into another issue related to categorization, and, and that's expertise. We'll talk about that when we get to later sections of the book. Um, but concept formation and categorization rely extensively on the notion of them being economical and the notion of them being non-redundant. And as we've seen, features are very helpful. And the uh, demonstration we did in class proves that, or at least shows it. We can make the distinction between necessary features and features that are OK. We don't really need them. They're helpful. Uh, but it will certainly slow us down if we make decisions based upon this information versus this information. So we necessarily will show, and this was done not only by Roche, uh, who's one of the articles uh, we read for this week, but in, in other uh, domains as well, that if I give you necessary or critical information versus defining or OK information and have you make judgments on it, decisions, what have you, we're going to show a response time difference. Be it in milliseconds, or like we did with the demonstration with the DSM over the course of uh, several seconds and even minutes. So we show an advantage suggesting that critical and defining features are also pretty helpful in us, not only encoding information, but now trying to conceptualize it and categorize it. So we have critical and defining features. We also have probabilistic features. You know, typical features versus required features. That also aids in our ability to categorize information. size, even shape, but yet you probably wouldn't make the mistake of calling that a dog or that a cat. Likewise, these two don't overlap at all. I mean, they have two ears, two eyes, four appendages, one's bigger than the other, but you probably wouldn't make the mistake of not calling that a dog or not calling that a dog. If I gave you these two pictures, 
saying yes, they're from the same category. So we have to be wary of how we set up concepts and categories. And this idea of percent overlap, think of like a Venn diagram. And I, I can't draw you one, I'd like to, but think of a Venn diagram probably from high school, probably when you were introduced to Venn diagrams, and we could chart the percent overlap between the, the various shapes. So we have typical members of categories. They tend to have more properties that overlap, and atypical members. They have less properties. They still overlap type of pet, dog and cat, those are uh, properties that overlap but not as much as typical properties. And in the category bird, for example, robin is a very typical uh, exemplar and at least in our uh, region, uh, penguins are very atypical, but they're still birds. They share some features, not all features, Robins are small, penguins are big. Robins can fly, penguins can't, but they're still birds. So this idea of percent overlap is critical when we're coming up with a category, but also when we're trying to differentiate between categories and also concepts. We have five different rules that we follow. And many of these rules are rules you had when you were little infants, prior to your first birthday, because there's a lot of evidence that infants are very good at categorization, and infants are very good at concept formation, knowing who their primary caregiver is. I mean, they can do that visually through habituation studies. They can do that uh, from a smell perspective as well. So little infants are able to categorize people based on smell. Primary caregiver has a very different kind of smell than a non-primary caregiver. So pretty much from birth onward, we're engaging in processes related to concept formation and categorization. So all of these rules kind of apply. Now, one of you wrote a question this week that kind of relates to this. And the question is, can the way in which we categorize previously categorized or learned items be altered in adulthood? Now that's kind of an interesting question because even though we know what a dog is, or we know what a cat is, or we know what an uresis is, as we get older, that may change. And so it is possible that we can alter our concept and category structure. And we do it not only in the ways I just talked about, but when we come up with different categories. So for example, you all have a concept of what a cat is. Some of you own cats, some of, doesn't matter, you have a concept of what a cat is. But if I show you pictures, <laughs> that's a real cat by the way. Does that alter your concept of what a cat is? Again, a real cat, not Photoshop. This, however, not true. So how does exposure to different exemplars, be they correct, incorrect, false, Photoshopped, whatever, alter 
our view of categorization. Anybody? Okay, so that becomes possible? Possible, but I'm also sitting on the side of the room, so I can't tell if it's Photoshop. Oh, oh it's, uh, it's Photoshop. Oh, okay. All right, then. So how, so say, say again what you said, Kate. Um, I think it can refine it. Because okay. It Okay, so if I show you pictures of big cats uh, like this, and they're obviously photoshopped and they're obviously false, how does that refine your category structure? Not just yours, but anybody's. Yep. To me, it allows me to become more rigid with it and more closely define something, so I am able to identify that as not being a picture of a real cat because okay. Some cats are pretty big. Not the size of a pony big. I no. Would that I would put that in a different category. Let me put it like this. I'd be like, oh, that's a mountain lion. Or that's a cheetah. Or that's another large cat. So. That's just. That's just a big that's cat. That's too much whiskers or whatever the problem might be. That I can't so our, the nature of our categories ch can change. If given true information, I mean, the first two pictures are, are true, the last one is false, how else could it change? I mean, one of you said or thought that the process of adulthood may also affect our categorization. How might that be true? Or how might that happen, actually? Yes. <laughs> So do certain features then kind of pop out, perhaps? I mean, we see this in a visual search. If I give you, um, you know, lines of a certain orientation and I put in there one that varies ever so slightly, 30 degrees, and I show you that on a screen, regardless of how many distractors I have in there, that little short little angle will pop right out at you very quickly. You'll be able to categorize that object very quickly. So maybe in some instances we might see a reordering of these criteria. I mean, these aren't really in any order. They could be in, in bottom to top, top to bottom, middle, out. But, but size might be one such thing that changes. Anybody else? Let me just read that question again. Can the way in which we categorize previously categorized or learn items be altered in adulthood? I think so. I mean, if I take up a hobby of bird watching, my categories of birds are going to be way more refined than they have been in the last 30 years. Mm -hmm. And then if I take up some other hobby, like I'm going to be into the Caribbean and I'm going to be into the Caribbean. Sure, you'll be able to pick out species that for everybody else who isn't uh, into bird watching, we would be unable to identify. They'd all be birds, basically. We wouldn't be at the finer level of this type of bird, that type of bird, that type of bird. Okay. So it could make for better categorization. So that necessarily leads to the question, do older people categorize better or faster or easier? Maybe. Maybe not. But the rapid exposure, not the rapid exposure, the continued exposure to different types of stimuli will do what? And we've talked about this in the pattern recognition chapter, but what will continued exposure to these items do for us cognitively? That will, like Kate says, make it easier to differentiate within a very narrowly defined birds category. Anybody? <laughs>
think of it like a prototype. Here we have four category members on the left. And we do this all the time. We try to extract what we think is critical. At the same time, extract what's not necessarily critical. And then come up with a prototype or an average. We've talked about prototypes in pattern recognition. We talked about prototypes in uh, semantic memory models. And here again, we see the uh, notion of a prototype. So we have four category members that vary on, uh, vary on a variety of dimensions. Uh, head shape or size is one dimension. Um, nose type is another dimension. Uh, smiling or frowning is another dimension or concept. Glasses or no glasses is another dimension. So from those four category members, and like many of the authors this week talked about, we have to somehow engage in a process where we dilute those category members, we distill them down to what we would call, in this case, the prototype. And if the prototype is correct, what should happen? Anybody? And why is that the prototype? Think of the Venn diagram example. Okay, so if we look at the mouth, three of the four figures here have a smiley face. Three of the four figures have the pointy nose. Three of the four figures have a round head. Three of the four figures are not wearing glasses. So we have to go through these various arguments, prepositions, propositions, whatever, to come out with this average or prototype. And we do this all the time. We can use the aneuresis example uh, as well here. I'll give you, I'll throw up one category membership concept. That doesn't work. If I were to, in this case, show you that, that would hardly be the prototype now because even though the head shape is correct, and the nose shape is correct. The wearing of the glasses is not, and the frowny, or the uh, smiley or frowny face is not. So that should be a lot more difficult if I were just to give you that. We would immediately say that's not the prototype. And as we gain more information, now make that decision, yes or no, now make the decision yes or no, now make the decision, yes or no. At some point in that process, here we just need four things to come up with a prototype. That's not always the case, but that's a pretty good estimation of what happens in the real world when we come up with prototypes. What's the prototypical college professor? What's the prototypical um, Christmas dinner? What's the prototypical wedding present? What's the prototypical whatever? And it all comes back to something as simplistic as we have these c category members, we distill down uh, what we think is critical, what we think is not critical. Here, head shape is not very critical. Although it does give us some information of what would be the prototype in this case. This kind of relates to not only something Roche talked about, but actually the chapter by Medine, or the article by Medine, that regardless of what the category is, we go through very similar processes to come up with that category structure. And so, for example, birds. There's a category. We learned that when we were little kids. Uh, we've refined that category over time. Some of you might be bird watchers or birders as they're called. So you have a very narrowly defined expertise 
And that's where we often come up with expertise out of categorization. You have a narrowly defined knowledge base on birds of North America or birds of North Dakota or birds of Grand Forks of all places. A very specific, very refined type of category. But regardless of that category, we could just say birds or I could give you what's called an ad hoc category. For example, think of these types of ad hoc categories. Now these are ones you didn't learn when you were little kids. Things you take from a house that is on fire. Now I don't know how recently you've thought of that question. What would be things you take from a house that's on fire. Okay. <laughs> or big children. It doesn't matter. Things that you can, things that can fall on your head. Probably never thought of that question before. Things you see in a police station. I've been hoping you haven't been in a police station recently, for whatever reason. Things you can buy at a gas station. Gas. Gas. <laughs> I hope. So those are examples of what we call ad hoc categories. Let me just show you what some people put for these responses. Now they've alphabetized them. And I've amended some of them. And this study was done in Britain. How do you know? Because they don't call it a gas station. They call it a petrol station. <laughs> but here's what some of the uh, folks indicated for these kinds of things. Now, again, they're in alphabetical order. But now we can start to break this down into typical examples, typical exemplars, and atypical exemplars. So, things you take from a house that is on fire. Camera, cats, children, clothes, documents, heirlooms, jewelry, money, pictures, records, stereo. What have I left out? Yeah, I don't see my name up there anywhere, or your name. So now you can start to see how complex category structures can be. Would we really expect to see donuts in a police station? Probably. Or paperwork? Probably. But even in these relatively simple examples, I could ask all of you, I won't do it for class though, but I could ask all of you to rank order what you think, you know, going from, let's see, two, four, six, eight, one to 11, rank order in your mind what you think would be the first thing you take, the middle thing you take, the last thing you take. Now you might say, well, I don't have any pictures in my house, or I don't have any documents in my house. So again, that may be different for different people, but even across the small numbers are in this class, we'd start to see some consistency. Even if we do top half, bottom half, a median split, if you will, we'd start to see a lot Certain things more likely to be in the top half, certain things more likely to be in the bottom half. So although we have these very nice and neat categories, cars, famous buildings, famous people, we also have these very idiosyncratic ad hoc categories that may be very specific to you that only you would use that type of category. Things you take to a wedding. How many of you have ever been to a wedding? What types of gifts do you take to a wedding? Even with that very kind of ad hoc category, you can immediately start to break it down into appropriate gifts, inappropriate gifts. Much like you do with run-of-the-mill, everyday, learned-when-you-were-little-kids kind of category. 
So regardless of the category type, birds or famous presidents, we run through and we try to apply these five criteria. For something to be a concept and for something to be related to categorization, it has to reduce complexity. Now, there are some folks out there, I think we talked about one case study in here already, of the person who couldn't categorize things that are living versus things that are dead. Now, to all of us, that's a pretty easy decision. Dead, living, easy. But for some individuals, that decision becomes very difficult. Or the person with obsessive compulsive disorder, they often have trouble with categorization. Why? Because they pay a lot of attention to particular features that aren't typically or aren't very helpful at the moment of categorization. So they pay attention perhaps to more irrelevant information as compared to relevant information. Not being able to resolve the relevancy, irrelevancy distinction will really jack up the complexity of the task. They'll take longer, which they typically do. They'll make more mistakes, which they typically do. And in some cases, they will not resolve that distinction. Like the person with the brain damage who can't distinguish living items from dead items. So concepts are relevant because they reduce complexity. Cognitive economy, we've talked about that concept before. Concepts help us identify things. But be careful on this identification. Think back to the example from the DSM. I gave you a concept. You weren't able to identify it. Eventually you could much like the family resemblance uh, uh, demonstration we did, the more relevant features I give to you up to a certain point, then you're able to set a criteria, perhaps not 100%, because nothing is perfect in the world, but you set a criteria and you make a decision. Now, if you make a wrong decision in diagnosing somebody, how do you correct that? It's enuresis, but you thought it was conduct disorder. How do you rectify that situation? Anybody? Or would you? I, mean, I think you'd have to rectify it at some point. Those are pretty differing disorders. So in your Venn diagram, you would have not no overlap, a little bit of overlap, a lot of overlap. Now you have to make that distinction. What is this thing that he's talking about? So concepts help us identify things, but we have to know what we're looking at we have to realize that's a helpful bit of information. That first item I gave you for enuresis wasn't helpful at all. I mean, it was to some extent. Your list of things that possibly could be may have narrowed down to 20 or 30 things that it possibly could be. Well, gee, we can't make a diagnosis based on that. So the, con the conceptual information has to be beneficial has to be relevant. Concepts reduce our need for constant learning. So knowing that a dog and a cat differ on some really important dimensions is very critical. And you don't want to have to relearn that. Oh, cat and dog. Oh, gosh. Let's see. 
cats are this, dogs are this, here's where they differ. Okay, now I know that distinction. Then you come up to a dog and a cat again, and you have to run through the same process over and over and over again. Some people don't learn the adequate features that distinguish between two concepts, or they get them mixed up, or they've learned them, and because of lack of exposure, lack of use, they've forgotten them. But in general, concepts will reduce our need for constant learning. How would they do that? I mean, is the definition in the DSM of enuresis really going to change much in the next 50 years? I don't know. Is it? I mean, do you think it will? How many of you have ever seen a case of enuresis? Well, how do you know what it is if you've never seen it? How many of you have seen a case of dissociative disorder, depression, anxiety? Okay. So mere exposure doesn't often help. You've never seen what enuresis is or had a client who's had that, but yet if I give you enough information, you'll kind of figure it out. So... We want our concepts to reduce constant learning. What's kind of related to this that's also related to diagnosing people? Kind of relates to the Venn diagram example I talked about. Anybody? called transfer of training. That's also related to point three up there. There are lots of things, I can't even remember what I said about enuresis and I took out my little post-it note on that page, uh, but the first thing I said First thing I said, chronological age is at least five years or equivalent developmental level. When you hear that, those of you with experience with the DSM, what do you think of? What were you thinking of when I said that? I mean, some of you were thinking of very specific disorders, but how large was the list you were picking off of? I'm assuming it was pretty big, because lots of things, um, thinking, could have chronological age is at least five years or equivalent developmental level. What else could that be? Anybody with experience with this? I mean, it was probably a huge, huge list. And then as I gave you more information, Behavior is clinically significant as manifested by either a frequency of twice a week or at least for at least three consecutive months or the presence of clinically significant distress or impairment in social, academic, occupational, or other important areas of functioning. Now what should have happened? Hopefully your list shouldn't have gotten bigger. It should have gotten smaller. And then I give you a little bit more information, a little bit smaller, a little more information, then you zero in on exactly what that was. But those other bits of information I gave you, those could be transferred to different disorders because there might be more than one disorder, I'm thinking, in the DSM that has a diagnostic criteria of chronological age is at least five years or equiv equivalent developmental level. So concepts and categories also allow us to transfer our training. Gee, that sounds like A, B, C, D, E. Or gee, that sounds like 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Or it sounds like something else. That also relates to the cognitive economy aspect of categories. 
you've seen that before, why not use it again to refine your categorization search or your categorization decision? Point four allows for decision making regarding appropriate actions. Your job is to diagnose somebody with something. How do you go about that diagnostic process? At what point do you make a decision? Gee, I think this person has this disorder. Well, how come it's not that disorder? How do you know it's that disorder and it's not that other disorder? At what point, from a criterion perspective, do you say, well, all the information I have, I'm not going to get any more information. I've gone through all the records. I've talked to the parents, the teacher, the whoever, the whatever. There's no more information I can get that's going to make for a better decision. So the diagnosis could be A or B. So concepts and categories also allow for better decision making. Now, I could give you false information that's going to affect that as well. Information that's not really necessary. So you have to be able to tease apart what's really critical and what's really not so critical. That's another dimension of categories, the fact that we have different levels across different categories. That's kind of what Roche talked about. This notion of not only a hierarchy, but also differing levels. For most of us, we learn the basic members of categories first. They're the easiest to learn. They provide us with the most information. But they're in the middle of the hierarchy. And basic members of categories are used naturally by adults to name objects. If that wasn't the case, life would be, and it is for some people, pretty chaotic, where they can't distinguish between the differences between the hierarchies. So, categories hopefully refine our decision making. Ten years from now, if I ask you the same question about enuresis and I give you that very vague uh, uh, example, your decision-making time might be a little bit quicker, presumably, over time, over practice. Same is true with our categories. They don't all stay the same. So to get back to that initial question, can the way in which we categorize Previously categorized or learned items be altered in adulthood. Geez, I hope so. Because that will benefit us, for the most part, to make a better decision, a quicker decision, a more thorough decision, an ethical decision, whatever the decision happens to be. And categories and concepts allow for us to structure our knowledge. Again, we go back to the work of Eleanor Roche, showing that, in fact, categories are hierarchical. Showing, in fact, that categories have differing levels, and we can show behavioral patterns across and within those different levels. People are faster at responding to basic level category information. Those that aren't, well, now we have a problem. Those that can't differentiate or respond fastest to or learn initially basic members of categories, that becomes a problem. And it could be a problem at any of these differing levels. Ideally, when we are categorizing information, be it types of birds or ad hoc categories, things to bring uh, appropriate gifts for weddings, we're going to follow the same kind of structure.
Will we ever use that appropriate things to bring to weddings again? Maybe. I don't know how many, uh, the average number of weddings people go to over the course of their lifetime. So even if it's one instance or several instances, we follow these same kind of rules. Rosh was interested in what happens in the real world. For example, some categories are just way too big. There's no way, even with the uh, infinite nature of long-term and semantic memory, that we're ever going to learn all of that information. This is related to there are over 7 million colors out there. I mean, we know that red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet, but there are over 7 million types of colors out there. How are we ever going to learn 7 million colors? Well, we're not. So regardless of the category type, natural categories, pets, vehicles, tools, fruit, or ad hoc categories that you may only use once in your lifetime, the structure is the same. And as we saw in previous discussions, and actually, as we'll see in the language chapters, categories are hierarchical. Hierarchical nature allows us to classify information quicker and more accurately, but also to categorize information more quickly and more accurately. The highest level is what Roche called the superordinate level it's the most general level. It's also the biggest level. And here, members of this superordinate level, like vehicles and furniture, have very little overlap. So their Venn diagrams don't overlap very much, maybe 5%, maybe 10%. After that level comes the one we learn first as we're developing, and studies with little kids show this quite nicely. This affects how we learn language as well, not just English, but other languages as well. So the basic level or the middle level of the hierarchy has members that share many features. So now the Venn diagrams are overlapping much more. And they have few features in common with other basic level categories. learned initially and not only used to promote language, we show reaction time differences. Here, instead of the sentence verification task, which we saw used in semantic memory research, we have another very elegant, very easy type of uh, verification task called object verification. Here's a name. Is this the uh, uh, pictorial representation of that name? 
So yes or no, object verification is also fastest for basic level categories. So it's learn first, it's easiest to learn, it shows us a response time difference, meaning we're quicker, more accurate, less mistakes. And what often happens at the basic level is we rely extensively on prototypes. Oh. Time for another break, folks. Five minutes. Folks, we were last talking about the middle level of the three-level hierarchy for categorization, and that was uh, what we call the basic level. We said it's the first learned and used the most as we're developing language, and we'll see that uh, next week and the week after. Those are the two uh, lectures devoted to language. Uh, we also showed that uh, uh, cognitively uh, we can verify information faster, more accurately, quicker uh, within basic level uh, categories. We also said prototypes are typical of basic level categories, and that kind of also relates to one of the other readings we had for this week by uh, Posner. That's the same Posner as before. And Keeley, this was a study done uh, back in the 1960s. Um, they looked at simple dot patterns, so uh, nothing very meaningful, so a kind of a simplified version of what Roche was looking at. And what they found was that even if you're not exposed to a certain pattern, you can extract information from it, the gist, and you store it each time you're exposed to that object, even if you're not explicitly exposed to it. And then when you classify uh, non-presented information, you're able to do that easily and efficiently. Now, what does that sound like that we've already talked about before in this class? Not today's class, but over the course of the semester so far. Related to schemas, what else? Processing. Okay, what else? I mean, what was the take home message of Posner and Keeley? And that first sentence is kind of what I'm getting at. Subjects can learn to classify sets of patterns which are distortions of a prototype even when they have not seen the prototype. What does that sound like that we've talked about in here? That you wouldn't think relates to categorization, but oops, actually does relate to categorization. False a false memory. What happens in a false memory? You're not shown an item visually, auditorily, however many ways they've done the false memory uh, paradigm. You're not explicitly shown something, yet you come up with that in recall. In the false memory paradigm, about 60 or 70 percent of the time. We see a very similar thing happening here. The gist of the info is extracted and stored each time, building up and building up and building up our prototype. So we don't even really have to be exposed to the actual item. We're still able to identify that item. This also relates to uh, schemas, which we talked about in the previous set of chapters, and Posner and Keeley actually refer to a prototype like a schema. So think of it from that perspective as well. Uh, prototype is an average, but it's also like a schema. It's a large uh, database of information that we tap into frequently, that we modify frequently uh, as new information comes in.
but again, according to these findings, we don't even have to be exposed to the specific information to identify it explicitly. So that's another benefit of categorization. We talked about the idea that you can transfer training. So you take information that's relevant, you transfer it to a new situation. You take information relevant to a specific diagnosis, and now you can transfer that to another diagnosis. Of course, certain things are going to be different, but a lot of diagnoses overlap to some extent. Same is true even in this experiment where they were presented with just random kind of dot patterns, not anything meaningful. Over time, with the uh, uh, access to a schema, they could identify something they weren't explicitly exposed to. Now if we go back to the hierarchy of Roche, the final level is what she calls the subordinate level. that share lots of features. So again, the Venn diagrams here are going to overlap considerably. But at the subordinate level, these features overlap with other subordinate objects. And the subordinate level categories of the three are usually the smallest in size and in scope. And so now we can see this kind of hierarchy, page 452. So here we have superordinate, basic level, subordinate. This is typically the easiest. This is much broader. Here we're getting very specific. So when we think of vehicle, we can think of sports cars, we can think of four-door sedan types of cars. When we think of furniture, we can think of a kitchen chair, a living room chair. But what's also interesting about these categories is how variable they are. How many of you would consider a toilet a chair? Anybody? Of course you're not going to admit it in this class. <laughs> but you might read on the toilet. You read while you're sitting in a chair. You're sitting on the toilet. You sit on a chair. I mean, a lot of those features overlap between a toilet and a chair. But nobody would ever call a toilet a chair, would they? They call it a throne. A throne is a type of chair. So, you know, even though these are very specific, there's also lots of variability within categories. That's what's so neat about ad hoc categories. These one-time, usually, categories that you need for one very specific situation. In the work of Medin, which was the third article that you read for today, also talked about these so-called ad hoc categories. Ad hoc categories are more personal, they're more specific, they're more idiosyncratic, they're more goal-derived. If you're going to a wedding and you don't know what to get for a wedding gift, you may tap into a new ad hoc category appropriate items to bring to a wedding. Now hopefully when you construct that category, because you'll probably use it again, you're probably not only going to ever go to one wedding in your lifetime, although I don't know, like I said earlier, what the average number of weddings is people go to. I'm sure somebody's calculated that somewhere. You're also going to want to expand that ad hoc category. Items you wouldn't bring to a wedding. 
So even at the most basic level, even ad hoc categories can be distinguished by things that fit the category, things that don't fit the category, even though it's this one-time use category. Bedeen talks about what he called unconstrained similarity. What he's getting at there is objects and categories are very much multidimensional. So if you go back to the question that one of you asked, would category structure change in adulthood? It certainly would. If we buy into what Medin says, it probably should expand. Not only based on age, but things like education, expertise, gender, you name a, 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 a factor, a category can be uh, distinguished by it or across it. And that also relates to, you know, perhaps the bad side of categories. Here's some data from an article by Neiman et al., Personnel and Social Psych Bulletin, back in 1994. Like other categories, they asked undergraduates to start categorizing here based on gender, males on the left, females on the right, but also race, Anglo-American, African-American, Asian-American, Mexican-American, and now list off those category exemplars that they think define those categories. And what's kind of interesting in this kind of old study, that's what, 22 years old, one thing they did in that study, and what others have done in that study, and this kind of relates to the, uh, um, the IAT paradigm that's now uh, all the rage in psychology and other disciplines, is they would present a category exemplar, or category name, African American, and then they would present one of these characteristics, or perhaps a characteristic from another category, and again get yes-no responses. And what's kind of interesting at one level and kind of uh, unfortunate at another level is that they presented that as the category name and then uh, that as the category exemplar or that as the category exemplar. Uh, they would get, you know, we talked about this earlier, the fast yes response or if they presented this as a category exemplar and that as a category uh, concept, they would get a fast no response. So much like in other domains and tasks that don't use these types of stimuli, they got very similar kinds of results. Here's another study, Spence and Buckner, 2000, Twenge, 1999. Again, looking at what folks believe are characteristics of these certain kinds of categories. So here are Masculine characteristics related to personality, feminine characteristics related to occupations and interests. And while you may agree or disagree with those, the issue becomes how ingrained these category exemplars can be and how they can really predict certain kinds of behavior. So I give you uh, that as an exemplar and that as a uh, thing to make a response to much like with other categories where we see this hierarchical structure, we see a fast yes response to feminine characteristic and aerobics, even though that might not always be the case. We can see how even in something as simplistic as uh, uh, you know, making yes no decisions about two or three words, where they have kind of enduring consequences. Why would you make a fast yes response to that? pairing of those words. What does that relate to about your underlying behavior or your underlying uh, biases? Same is true with these. Again, we don't want to believe that this is what people are thinking, but in fact, this is what people are thinking, either at the, right at the surface of consciousness or a little bit below consciousness or at the opposite end, way above consciousness where they'll say these things out loud, they'll say them to the person in question, they won't care what they say. And it again, all gets back to how we structure uh, 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 different concepts and how we use those concepts in 
categorization. Let's see. Some of this we've kind of already gone over. You can look at categories between levels. That's the main hierarchy. But also within a given level. So is olive a good example of fruit? An olive is a fruit, but we don't think of an olive as a fruit. Is a pants a good example of clothing? Well, yeah, for the most part, pants is a pretty good example of clothing. This relates to what we typically see within categories. And we know these occur psychologically because we show response time differences. If we didn't show response time differences, we could then argue, well, there's not a hierarchy, A, and there's not this uh, dimension of typicality. Typicality, and we've talked about this before as well. Uh, again, think of the Venn diagram example, more in common with other members of the category. So, is olive a good example of fruit? No, it's not. But an olive is a fruit. Sorry, that's life. Deal with it. Is pants a good example of clothing? Well, nowadays, yeah, pants is still considered a pretty good example of clothing. Will that change? Who knows, maybe. But we can think of more typical members, least typical members. It's not that you can't make the decision, you know, fruit and olive, same or different. Well, you'd probably say same, but in fact they're different at some level, they're the same at another level. Those become progressively more difficult questions to answer. We talked about family resemblance in the example I showed with those different faces, and that eventually comes up with a prototype. What's a prototypical fruit? What's a prototypical vegetable? What's a prototypical car? What's a prototypical gift you bring to a wedding? It's a toaster, actually. People have investigated that. It's a toaster. Just check the gift table at the wedding. It's full of toasters. So typicality relates to what we call family resemblance. In a verification task, be it name, object, sound, pretty much any modality, typical members are verified faster. Now, of course, you have to control for frequency, number of letters, all sorts of different variables. But when you control for all those variables, you still show what's called a typicality effect. Shared features also correlate with typicality. More typical items have more overlap. So now we have the Venn diagrams kind of right on top of each other. An orange, an apple, and a banana versus a coconut, a tomato, and an olive. In one of those instances, there's more correlation between the items. In the other, there's less correlation, but there's still some correlation. And if we calculated that correlation, which we could, these would be higher, these would be lower. We'd get a response time advantage here. We'd get a response time disadvantage over there. We'd get an error rate. Advantage here, we get an error rate advantage, a disadvantage over there. What else do I want to talk about? We kind of did this example in class. When I gave you the broadest feature of the condition where you probably came up with internally lots of, gee, it could be this, 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 this. Now I give you another feature. Well, that narrows the list down, hopefully. Another one, oh, narrowed it down even further. And now, you know, here's the, the very critical feature of that diagnosis, and you were very quick to identify it. 
Oh, let's see. I think that that's all I'm going to talk about today. So we are done. Remember, we, we end at 1130, not 1145. So we're done for today.